Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to crack straight on. I've got lots of information I want to share, lots of insights. Um, okay, so I want to challenge some perceptions, um, reduce teacher workload, which has become a huge personal priority of mine. Um, if you're familiar with my Twitter feed, um, you know, pushing 200,000 followers now, it's quite a scary responsibility to tweet personal thoughts, uh, entice the next generation of teachers, but also hold the likes of Ofsted and the Department for Education to account, and, and quite a few of those uh, colleagues follow me on Twitter. Um, and then right at the very end, so I'm going to try and break uh, each area into 10 minutes. I'll squeeze in loads of resources and I'll signpost. So the first thing I want to do, because I won't be able to share all my 25 years' experience, uh, that needs a capital CPD. If you take a picture or just write it down, I'll show it to you at the very end. Um, it'll take you to a website um, link on my site uh, with loads of things you can read more. Um, I hope there'll be one thing that will quite fascinate you and you'll want to take back to your place of work. So uh, capital CPD, lowercase pack. Uh, I'll show you that at the end. So my first rhetorical question, why are teachers leaving the profession? Um, so I just want to kind of share some research. Now, Nikki Morgan, if you remember Nikki, um, Education Secretary of State. Um, you know, if you look at your statistics with Secretary of States, they kind of disappear after 801 days. So Damien Hines has got about 400 days to go. Um, I predict before, uh, when Brexit actually happens, we might see a cabinet reshuffle. Um, 44,000 teachers responded to this survey. I do think we have come a long way, but I don't think we're there yet. 44,000 teachers said putting information onto Sims, ISAMs, Progresso, whatever platform you use, is driving me crazy. Second one was marking. So in the last two years, I've been teacher training full time. I've probably been to about 100 schools across the UK. It's been the most amazing privilege of my career to go and work with colleagues. And when I do um, live voting on your devices, I won't do it today, um, but every setting I visit, primary, independent, international, marking is driving teachers nuts. So what we need to do as school leaders, and when I say school leaders, I mean anybody with a teaching and learning responsibility who's in charge of looking after somebody else. That's what I mean by leadership. We have a duty to go back to our places of work and actually try to reduce teachers' workload. Um, third one I've got here is staff meetings. Hands up if you like a meeting, anybody? <coughs> Hands up if you like a meeting, anyone? Oh, Julian, okay, good. Um, so I've asked the question to 15,000 teachers. I think about 151 hands now. No one likes meetings, so why do we keep doing them? Keeping people busy, trust people. Um, research shows if you have a stand-up meeting, they'll go quicker. So the next time you meet difficult mum and dad, or Ross, who's a bit naughty in your classroom, your parents don't sit down would be my top advice. Um, if you line manage someone, get out of your office and go for a walk. It's good for your mental health. Um, some Asian schools I've researched and visited, they have amber, orange and red lines with the number of minutes painted on and it's painted throughout the corridors and into the playground and you just follow it subconsciously as it counts down uh, and you follow the lines. So if it's a 15 minute meeting you follow the red line. Um, it's great for visible presence around the school, good for your mental health. Um, a colleague at Cambridge I'm working with, Jude Brady, she put this research out last, um, last year, April. She looked at the differences between independent teachers and state school teachers. Both teachers in both settings work in excess of 55 hours per week to keep up with their workload. The key difference between state school teachers is they're often asked to complete meaningless tasks. Uh, so they don't mind doing the hard work, it's just they don't believe in what they're being asked to do. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, not a lot of people look at the Department for Education census. I only started to look at this when I started the blog and I was getting critique from all around the world and being challenged. So I started to have to access research and data to be, I guess, credible if I was blogging to 200,000 people a month. Um, the data is really clear. It goes back 20 plus years. 20-ish thousand teachers enter the profession every year, year on year. Um, last year, was the first time ever in the data collection more teachers left England, state schools, than ever before. Now, the data's out next, uh, in a couple of months from the department. Um, I'm going to predict that it's going to happen again for a second year in a row. And we'll know the pupil population enters um, secondary schools in 2025. We're going to need double the number, 47,000. When you look where I put the red circle on the left, a large one, we often hear in the press teachers leave within the first five years. Well, actually, when you look at the details, first three, but we're not going to tell the public that because it's much more waste of taxpayer cash. 
So actually, people in the room who are in their first to second, third year teaching, you are at your most vulnerable, and I believe NQT induction is not enough. To see you through 20 plus years, I'm off the scale, I had about 36% chance of staying in teaching. Every year you're in, you drop 2% in terms of the data. Okay, so work out where you are in the chat, have a little look. Um, did you know there are 350 qualified teachers in England today, qualified, who aren't in schools? I've always believed we have a retention crisis, not just a recruitment crisis. We can't keep our teachers and we can't entice them back. 350,000 folks. Um, anyone heard of this word? Phrenesis. It means professional wisdom. I discovered it from Hal Roberts, who's on Twitter. Um, great chat. We were at a conference together in Germany last October and he mentioned this word, professional wisdom. What it looks like in the classroom is I give um, Chris here at the front a glower, so if you're not, if you're not sure, non-verbal, uh, one eyebrow. Chris moves seats without me speaking, okay, and that's my experience, my behaviour management, not talking, non-verbal communication, Chris moves. That's an idiosyncratic decision I make on my feet every day in the classroom thousands of times in my internal database. I can't put that glower on Sims, sadly. It really is important to me in the classroom and to Chris, but sadly our politicians or our school leaders don't want that data. Um, so phrenesis matters, and what the research shows, you're familiar with Professor Becky Allen and Dr. Sam Sims, they wrote a fabulous book called The Teacher Gap, loads of solutions for the retention crisis. Their research has unpicked that most teachers reach their optimum performance in their third or fourth year of teaching. And I think we need to do more to help our teachers in those first early years. Um, why do teachers leave? Um, so this was out a couple of summers ago. Um, it's workload and offset pressure. It's not behaviour. Yes, we all teach tough classes, we work in difficult schools. It's not salary, even though we know we should be paid better. And actually, when you look at Jem's Varky research, which is published every five years, the data shows the public believe we work less than we actually do, and we're paid more than we actually are. So we need to change the narrative. Um, this is interesting. When you leave teaching, come back to teaching and leave again, why? To raise a family. The job where we're in the business of kids isn't compatible with having our own family. And I recall when I had my son seven, eight years ago as a deputy head teacher, it was an absolute nightmare to try and balance dropping him off at nursery and trying to get into the school gates on time. Um, so we need to do more in flexible working, and I hope the government, they have published quite a few things recently, they can do a lot more to entice more people in. Um, on my travels, I've met five head, co-headships uh, in five schools sharing the headship role, and I think that's quite a nice thing to see. Next rhetorical question. So I guess in schools, but in your workplace, if you're not in a school, what does you, what's your employer doing to support mental health? We all have mental health, but we're not all mentally ill. There's a big difference. Uh, so things like going for a jog, I've just bought myself um, a lovely little border collie, I'm out at the park, I have to be out every day and it's wonderful. Um, so what, what's your employer doing? So this is a little insight behind the scenes as to what I see on Twitter. About every three months, 18 million people see my tweets, so it's quite frightening, quite a responsibility, about six or seven million a month. Um, I've asked this same question, I'm going to put it out in the summer actually, um, for the last two or three years. On the left, who's driving teacher workload? Ofsted or school leaders? At the deputy head at the time, I was quite gutted to see 71% of my followers said it's school leaders. So I had to start unpicking it a bit more. On the right, I broke it down. Is it the DFE, Ofsted? Or is it teacher habits or school leaders? It came back school leaders again. When I say it, I mean leaders in a broad sense. If you're responsible for someone else, you are a school leader. Um, I did it again in January, and I'm going to put one out next month. Um, still school leaders. So I wonder what the issue is, because I've worked with thousands of school leaders, and I've been one myself, and I know the burden that they're under too. Um, I get these all the time. I'm not a fool to think I don't know the full picture, but I'm literally getting these once or twice a week. I sign people to the right charities, or if I don't have any uh, expertise advice, I do what I can to forward it on. Um, I've just been told by a deputy head that a childcare emergency is not an acceptable reason for attending a directed time meeting. Both my wife and I are teachers. This chap's now left that school. Um, another one, I'll quote him, I'm going to effing destroy you, you'll never teach again. At the bottom, it keeps me awake at night, if I'm honest. These are experienced people. That box simply says, I've gone four days a week to cope, and I'm just working the same number of hours. Um, next one, deputy head, special measures, head's gone, chair of governors has gone, 
um, what to do. I'm going to the GP. I'm stressed as hell. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm not encouraging these. I'm getting these all the time. Um, now, it's very easy on social media for us to all think the world's rosy. It's far from it. It took me six months to share this picture publicly. This is two weeks, a photo I took of myself two weeks after my school was placed in special measures. My head teacher was sacked. Half my school leadership disappeared. I had to step up, acting head teacher some days. Um, so here it is, blepharitis. This is my body saying, Ross, you're stressed. You can't cope with the impact. I lost my job eight years ago and I took voluntary redundancy. So the stigma associated with, are you difficult to work with, Ross? Are you not very good? You know, all that perception still exists today. And, and with school funding, it's even harder for head teachers to keep the right people in the job. So I had to go through all these decisions, nosebleeds, diarrhoea, four hours sleep over a two-day two inspection. Um, shall I go redundant again or shall I try something different? So I chose to have a better life. Um, and, we have, and we think we have a retention crisis when we have a high-stakes accountability model that pushes people out of the profession. I've made freedom of information requests quite a habit of mine, so if you're on my blog, you'll be familiar of where Damien Hines, Amanda Spielman, Nick Gibb, what schools they prefer to visit. It's generally London schools uh, and good or outstanding academies. So if you work in a tough state school, folks, requires improvement, you've got no chance of a visit from education royalty, I'm afraid. Um, I've unpicked this note here. At the very bottom, you can see all the numbers have been re-manipulated to suit what the lead inspector thinks, even after a conversation with me for an hour from 100 teachers teaching night and day, three-year three, three year programme of developing teaching and learning. The whole world's sucking up my ideas of Mark Plan Teach, but apparently one person pops in and doesn't think it's very good. Well, I think we need to change the narrative in terms of accountability. Um, now, I know you've done a quiz on your, on your um, voting devices before. My technology's failed me, so I'm going to just stick these questions up and turn to your partner and just give me an answer. Um, what do you think? If I take 10 kids out of your class, what do you think happens? A, B or C? Substantial, small or no change at all? Turn to your person, make a vote. I've got 10 of these. Okay, so I will give you the link so you can look at all this research. I've got 10 here. I'm going to whiz through them all. Um, if you find one that's interesting, then I would recommend look at the research paper. I'll give you the hyperlink to download it. Take one back to your school and have a little look. So the correct answer here, and it's all up for debate, I know, and context is key. But the correct answer here is B. Um, it's pretty clear. It makes a small increase. Question two, what's the greatest benefit then? Is it less stress for you? Better feedback for kids or more individual attention? Turn to your partner, make a choice. Okay. Correct answer, folks. Uh, correct answer is A, it's less stressful for the teacher, but it is open to discussion. Um, I'll signpost you to the Education Endowment Foundation, which you should all be aware of. Their teaching and learning toolkit, they had a piece of uh, research come out, uh, a marked improvement. Uh, feedback, quality, not quantity, essentially. Um, okay, ICT, very applicable for today. Um, what does it do? Does it enhance learning? Does it motivate kids? Reduce my workload? Promote activities if it's aligned with subject content? Or give kids more control? Turn to your partner, 30 seconds. Okay, so correct answer here is C, but if you chose D, then let's give me an example, so grab my ear later and, and give me an example and tell me how, describe how that technology uh, changed your thinking. Question four, which of these is best supported by evidence, giving kids a one-to-one -one iPad, um, using your whiteboard, or for technology for short bursts of activity? Turn to your partner. Okay. Easy, should be C. Short bursts, okay? Retrieval, practice, cognitive science should be familiar with all this stuff, particularly active on social media at the moment. When's it a good time to test kids? A, never. B, before, test what they don't know. C, immediately after, or let them forget, then test them. You can choose more than one. Okay. 
B, C and D are all supported by research in this case. Okay, one more on, on testing. Um, after studying a topic, students remember more if they spend the same amount of time. Study it again in a single session, shorter sessions. Study it again and be tested or repeatedly be tested but don't study. Big difference. Okay, you can choose more than one. Okay, so the correct answer here, or they're all correct, but D is the most strongest, backed by research. C works, so does B, and so does A, but it's recommending use D first, A the least. Okay? Repeatedly test kids, but don't study it any further. Uh, you'll be familiar with the terms interleaving and space practice, I hope. Um, all on my website. Uh, learning styles, it's good to just ask this question. Does it determine which part of the brain, I know you've been asked this from Kat earlier, something similar, um, how well they can learn or well, nothing about performance? A, B or C, how turn your partner? Okay, correct answer is C. Learning styles have been largely debunked, still quite predominant in the US actually, um, but being, research is very clear, it shows nothing about how we learn. Uh, question 8, I'm going to skip. It's C again. There's no correlation within how we learn and, you know, what style we have. Okay, it's not to deny they don't exist, by the way. Um, question 9, for students who lack confidence, reassuring them that they are good at X, Y, Z, so whatever that is, um, reading, is most likely to A, B or C. Okay, have a little quick chat to your partner. Okay, so this research comes from Carol Dweck in her work Mindset. I've had the pleasure of meeting Carol. She's very frustrated that her research has been lost in translation. Um, however, the correct answer here is, in, is B. You need to make kids think that this strategy matters. So whether it's reading, uh, re doing an equation or cutting out a piece of wood in a DT classroom, whatever it is, ex explicitly link it to that strategy matters. In that case, particularly for the exam season... Okay, which is right now, if a student gets a poor piece of work, how can I get best improvement from them? What should I do? A, B or C? Turn to your partner. Which one? Okay, so correct answers, folks. Carol Dweck's research is clear on this. Use C, but do it through B, not A. Don't say, oh, never mind, give me a cuddle. Doesn't help learn. It, and again, context is key. You might work with vulnerable kids, autistic kids, you know, those types of settings, I understand. But show your frustration. I've taught you this before. Phrenesis, it means professional wisdom. How do you spell it? Okay, and then link it to C. Link it to an actual strategy and uh, lack of effort. Okay, so there are papers. There's the link at the top, capital T-T-R. You can download this three page with all the links. This comes from this paper, just uh, What Makes Great Teaching, with Professor Robert Coe at Durham University, their institution, the Centre of Education Management. Fabulous research. If I think back to six years, part of their research, myself and a few other bloggers, was quite instrumental in getting rid of Ofsted grading lessons back in 2013. Um, I haven't got time to talk about that today, but it's worth checking out. The paper on the left, Barrett Rosenschein, this is doing all the rounds on social media. I suspect it won't reach schools for another five years, so I'm giving you a heads up. Take a look. Um, if you put that on my website, 17 Principles, what I've done is... Research rarely tells teachers what to do. It gives you the findings, but what does it look like in my classroom? So what I've done here is I've looked at the research, I've written a paragraph what it says, I've then written a paragraph what it would look like in the classroom, and here's a link. So type that uh, title in my site and you'll get a nice read. Take it back to your schools, wait till after the exam season and talk about it and look at what it looks like in your department, your year teams, or your own subject. It's absolute gold dust. Um, Rosenshine's research, this is 40 years of teaching and learning research, his paper. He passed away in 2002, um, University of Chicago. 
Um, Barrick Rosenstein, great stuff. Right, some quick bad science. Got 10 minutes. I'm going to go through mu as much as I can. 35% of schools in my research still do grade teachers. Still grade teachers. They pop in, you've been teaching 10 years, but we'll judge you in 30 minutes. Why do we do that to ourselves? Aren't we wanting to be professionals? Then we'd report to governors. And again, this might have been stemmed from accountability, what Ofsted want, and those types of things. So if you um, work in a school where you got, or you've got a colleague who still grades lessons, the research is clear. This was quite instrumental. I can come and grade you, say you're good or requires improvement, but someone else will come and give you a different grade, up to 78% chance. So my top tip here, folks, don't ask for a second opinion if you get outstanding. Okay? <laughs> If you get an adequate 90% chance, definitely ask for a second opinion. I think as a teacher, when I was getting graded, I asked for second opinions. When I got requires improvement, I didn't believe it. Okay? When I got outstanding, I kept quiet. Okay? <laughs> and I got all the badges as a school leader too. And guess what? In 25 years of teaching, apart from being a bit more immersed in cognitive science and research, I've been doing pretty much the same thing for 25 years. It's the type of school in which you work that makes the difference. Um, this is only the one piece of research of its kind. What happens after Ofsted grades you on teacher re retention? Well, no surprises. Get an inadequate judgment, 5% of your workforce will disappear. Outstanding, most people will stay. Okay? And I've got some books here as prizes. I've got some PhD research with one of my bloggers here, Toxic Schools. We like to uh, put this topic under the carpet and ignore it, but there are lots of people choosing to work in tough schools where it goes against them, or they're working in toxic leadership situations where it's bad for teachers' mental health, and dare I say it's bad for kids. Um, this also, Ofsted, I've always said for 26 years, it's what parents want. They want schools to be graded. Hopefully next term, this term, they're going to actually publish that research. They've never done it before. 19% of parents read the full report. I bet we all read the report when we go for a job. Okay, so could we be fueling the system ourselves? We need to change the narrative. Let's stop doing this. We never put, we are requires improvement. Come to our school, please. <laughs> so change the narrative. Let's do this instead. Mr. McGill says it's great to work at this school. They really support my professional development. Put that on your letterhead. Put that on your gates, put it on your pencils and whatever else. I used to love being a student at this school I'm now training to be. Or I feel safe and happy at this school, X, Y, Z. We need to change the narrative. Pull down your posters, let's put up our own ones. Um, appraisal research. Michael Gove, I'll say it quietly, he follows me on Twitter. Um, I'm not bragging about it, but when I met him in 2014, um, and we talked about performance-related pay when he introduced it as a statutory obligation, there's no research, folks, to say that it makes improvements in learning. None. So a little bit of research. Type in that on Google Scholar, you get 97,000 entries. Add leading to teacher improvement, 76,000. Put in from 2010, it drops to 18,000. I've had a little dip in there. There's none that directly lead to English settings uh, that actually lead to improvements in learning. Okay, and then we dig a bit further, the American uh, Scientific Association, 2014. I'm a good teacher, so are you. We can get up to about 14% impact on kids' outcomes. The difference, I work with kids in gangs and knives, so I've got no chance of getting outstanding. You work in a leafy suburb school. Um, so the difference is 85%. We know Wi-Fi, tutoring, and all sorts of things. So we need to change the way, the metrics of how we judge our schools. This is interesting. It's not statutory, but I bet most schools have got one. We put it out online, people pop in to visit our school. That's my school's one on the left. We spent three years building that. All the inspector cared about was marking. They went and looked at a few books on their own, no conversations. What happened? Here's a screenshot from one Ofsted report. It says in the second sentence down, some teachers are not regularly checking student misconceptions in line with policy. My argument is don't put it in your policy. In fact, don't have one at all. It's not statutory. Otherwise, it will just go against you. Um, so here's a little test, a little cognitive test here. Have a look at that sentence. You've not seen it before. It's in your short-term memory. Just like we do at conferences or in the classroom or when I come to inspect your school, I say, how many letter Fs are in this sentence? You're under pressure. You need to respond. And I ask um, Joe for an answer. Five. Five. Joe, the six, call yourself a teacher. Okay, and so on and so forth. So we look at phonics, f is a Finnish sound, of is an OV sound. What Joe suffered here from is called redundancy effect. 
She's looking for the F rather than looking at the sentence. Again, it's in our short-term memory, which is often what happens in the classroom when we ask kids questions in front of their peers, when we test kids for exams, or when we do inspections, or guess what, when I come to observe you, I might make a mistake. Okay, um, so resources, I'm going to skip through all of these. I've got three copies of my book. I'll give it to um, a few people to hand out as prizes later. Um, loads of ideas that I've built up with loads of colleagues I work with and through my social media um, to give away. Um, yellow box, yeah, it doesn't have to be yellow. It's not backed by any research using yellow. It's the <laughs> methodology that works. Find one thing, fix it. Great for teacher workload. Again, on my blog, you've got 13 ideas. Number seven. Kids, before you leave, can you open your book to the page, please? That's going to save me 30 seconds finding it later. Times 30, kids. Five days a week, five lessons a day, 25 lessons a week. How much time am I going to save compared to you if kids leave their book open for me? Um, that's on my blog. Five-minute lesson plan, one million downloads. Every teacher in the world needs to go to a lesson with a plan, whether it's on paper or in their head. So the five-minute thought process, what, why, how, is a nice little methodology for new and old teachers. Um, this is a great book, Leverage Leadership. There's a five-minute script for that difficult conversation with mum and dad on your feet. Ross, you're really good at this. Why do you do that? Let's identify one or two things to do. Um, how long is it going to take? Well, I'm going to check. Tell me what you're going to do now. Lock it in, tell me it back. It's a great script. I use that with all my coaching work with schools around the country. Um, resources, workload evaluation. If you've not asked your teachers, don't assume that it's, um, they don't, um, you haven't got any workload issues. You need to ask. Um, workload plans, reflection questions. We often get a promotion, but we never get any training before, so we make a few mistakes in our first term or year before we learn the ropes. So how do we know? There's a little self-reflection there. CPD menu. If I join your school, what professional development am I going to get? Is it transparent? A simple menu on display in the staff room lets me know what I can ask for and how much of it will be funded. Um, easy. So there's the link, folks. CPD pack. I'm just going to squeeze three things that I'm working on at the moment. Um, on the left, verbal feedback. As a design technology teacher, me and my kids would bang a hammer for five weeks and then we'd write an evaluation for one week. Someone would come in and look at our books and think there's not much work here. Um, and I'm sure lots of creative teachers in the room, drama, art, PE, will feel the same. So that's led me to conduct verbal feedback research. In the middle, social media, and on the right, all the insights that I've found on my travels. So the verbal feedback, I've got seven state schools, disadvantaged schools across the UK. This is their research question. To what extent does verbal feedback implemented for two terms make a difference on kids' outcomes? I'm conscious I don't want to influence the bias, so they come up with this question themselves with the academics at UCL. That research is going to be published in September. My only warning is the proxy of engagement. We need to define that. Is it attendance to class? Is it participation in lessons, answering questions? So I'll get back to you on that one. Um, my current uh, doctorate focus um, is looking at these four aspects. We all have a voice online now. Um, we can learn things from one another. We can create petitions. We can go on strike and so on and so forth. And then we can bring people together to change the narrative. If you're on Twitter, you'll, you'll have seen that a lot. Um, I'm looking at all these very in interesting maps of webs of connection and where certain terms such as knowledge rich and wherever first evolved through the social media network. It's a, it's a kind of... Um, Loose statement, I know, but my gut suggests that often what evolves through social media is a good number of years ahead of what happens on the ground in schools. Um, so I'm unpicking lots of things. Um, these are the skills that I'm currently working with in terms of looking at all the challenges that teachers face, um, but what some schools are doing about it. So there's a real mix of uh, jurisdictions, grammar schools, non-selective schools, all sorts and so forth. Head teachers are struggling with um, research-led practice. I don't have time to access research. I'm time poor. Can someone please disseminate it for me, give me a three-minute read, and then tell me what to do in my school or find out what's best for my context? We often misconstrue collective teacher efficacy, which is John Hattie's number one on his visible learning, that we all have to do the same thing. That's not true. It means look at the research, Tackle it and work out what suits your kids. And the schools that do that are getting better outcomes. Um, head teachers' curriculum, teaching and learning, SEND, they're really good at those things. They're struggling with research, assessment, and, and um, teachers. 
They're struggling with their own well-being and tackling with the issues of pupil mental health with limited resources. I'm going to wrap it up. That's what I've tried to tackle. Um, I hope one thing might have led to promotion. You've got lots of links to find out later. I'm here for the rest of the afternoon, so come and bend my ear. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much.